Hi there. In this video, we will go over Amazon Web Services Virtual Private Cloud. And we will go over various VPC components such as a VPC subnet, a CIDR block, and an IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. So let's get started. In this image over here, we give the example of the various components of a virtual private cloud. As you can see over here, this AWS cloud infrastructure houses one particular AWS region. Within that region, you have three availability zones. Your virtual private cloud is within the AWS region and it spans all three availability zones. In certain cases, certain AWS regions only have two availability zones. In this example, we have three availability zones in the AWS region. The virtual private cloud is a logically isolated network where you can place your AWS resources. Your virtual private cloud is further divided into additional subnetworks, which are also known as subnets. There are two types of subnets, a public subnet, which is connected to the internet, and private subnets, which are not connected directly to the internet. The reason why we use public and private subnet is because in this example, we have an application which is created into three tiers, a client-facing tier, an application tier, and a database tier. Only the client-facing tier needs direct internet connectivity, which is why these instances are in a public subnet and these subnets are connected directly to an internet gateway via the router. The other subnets do not need internet connectivity and therefore they are placed in private subnets. In case a EC2 instance in a private subnet does need to connect to the internet in order to download patches, then your route table can be connected to a NAT gateway. The NAT gateway ensures that only internet connectivity is established when the EC2 instance requires connectivity to the internet. However, the internet cannot connect directly back to the EC2 instance without the right permission. Also shown in this image are VPN gateways and direct connect gateways. They are used when you need to connect your virtual private cloud to your on-premises data center. A VPN gateway allows you to connect to your on-premises data center using the internet itself. A VPN gateway consists of a customer gateway on your on-premises data center site and the VPN gateway on your AWS side. The VPN connection, as mentioned, allows you to connect from your AWS VPC to your on-premises data center over the internet. However, if internet bandwidth is not sufficient for your requirements, then you can also use AWS Direct Connect. The AWS Direct Connect is basically a standard Ethernet cable which is connected with your AWS VPC and to your on-premises data center, which gives you higher bandwidth as compared to a VPN connection. The AWS Direct Connect also contains a customer gateway and a virtual private gateway. The customer gateway helps connect your Direct Connect lo location to the AWS Direct Connect and the virtual private gateway connects the AWS Direct uh, Connect to your VPC. The other components that are important to note for your VPC are an internet gateway, a NAT gateway, the VPN gateway and virtual private gateway for your VPN and Direct Connect have already been covered. We will also discuss what is a VPC router, what is a route table, and also what are the various firewalls within your VPC to protect your subnets and EC2 instances, which are the network access control list and your security groups. Also, we will cover other VPC components, such as a VPC endpoint, and a private link peering connection. The VPC endpoint allows you to securely connect to other AWS services without requiring the need of a either internet gateway, a NAT gateway, or either a VPN or a direct connect connection. It allows you to securely use AWS's own infrastructure to connect to various AWS services so that you have more security. You can also connect to additional virtual private clouds which could be housed within the same AWS region or they could be in other AWS regions provided by AWS cloud infrastructure. Now that we have gone through the overview 
of the various components of a VPC, keeping in mind uh, when building a three-tier application, we now go into further details of these various components. When you go to your AWS Management Console, the first thing that you will see on a VPC dashboard is how to launch a VPC wizard. We will go through this later. However, what we want to show to you is just now in our previous image where we highlighted the various components of a virtual private cloud. This is illustrated in text within your AWS Management Console. So you have a virtual private cloud within which you can create subnets associated with route tables, add an internet gateway, add either a NAT gateway or egress only internet gateways for your private uh, instances in your private subnet. You can also add a network access control list and security groups for building firewalls. You can have a customer gateway, a virtual private gateway, which provide VPN or direct connect connectivity. You have your endpoints and endpoint services and so on and so forth. We will cover majority of these components in our videos as we go along. Now these components are further classified in this table to give you a better overview of what each service does. The way we see it is a VPC and a subnet are like network containers because these containers allow you to put your AWS resources inside these network containers. A VPC is your main logically isolated network where you place all your AWS resources which connect to clients and AWS services. The subnet is simply further partitioning of the IP address range of your B VPC to create smaller isolated networks using your classless internet domain routing block. There are two types of subnets as highlighted, a public subnet and a private subnet. And as I explained earlier, a public subnet is associated with an internet gateway for internet connectivity, whereas a private subnet is simply not having any internet connectivity, unless associated with a NAT gateway or a direct connect. A router simply routes traffic from one network to another. We have the internet gateway, which is simply a gateway, which provides, allows your VPC to communicate with the internet. You have a NAT gateway for IPv4 and an egress only gateway for IPv6 addresses. Basically, these gateways allow instances in a private subnet to connect to the internet while preventing the internet to connect directly to instances in the private subnet. Additionally, we categorize VPN gateways and AWS Direct Connect gateways as gateways for hybrid connectivity because they allow connectivity for on-premises and off-premises. As explained earlier, the VPN gateway allows you to connect to your on-premises network via the internet broadband. However, a Direct Connect gateway establishes VPN connectivity through a direct cable connection between AWS and your on-premises network. We also have a VPC endpoint and a VPC peering connection. We categorize them as endpoints. As explained earlier, the VPC endpoint enables connection between the VPC and your AWS services without requiring the use of an either an internet gateway or a NAT device, VPN connection or AWS direct connect connection. This gives you a more secure way to connect to AWS services through the AWS infrastructure itself. A peering connection simply helps connect your VPCs, which could be within the region or across region without needing the internet. Finally, we have your NACLs or network access control lists and security groups, which are firewalls, and we will go through these details further along. Now that we have understood the various components of a VPC, let us understand a bit more of what a VPC does. So the virtual private cloud enables you to launch AWS resources within the virtual network that you've defined. The resources that you have are like your EC2 instances, which help you to run your application as well as to be able to connect to other AWS services. How does a VPC achieve fault tolerance and how does a VPC achieve high availability? So a virtual private cloud is region specific. It is not cross-regional and your VPC does not span across additional AWS region. So as you can see over here, in this image over here, we have three different AWS regions. And to make it simple, we have VPC 1, 
VPC2 and VPC3. Your single VPC does not span across regions. Your VPC spans across the availability zones within a single region. So, in order to have fault tolerant architecture, you would need to have VPCs in more than one region and standby resources in the additional region. A VPC, however, is always highly available because it spans across multiple availability zones, as many as provided by the AWS region. By placing your AWS resources across availability zones within the same region, you have a highly available architecture. And as you can see in this image, we have placed our resources across these availability zones to ensure that in case there is a failure in one AZ, the other availability zones can take over and minimize downtime to service disruption. To create a VPC, you must specify a range of either IPv4 addresses or IPv6 addresses for the VPC in the form of a classless interdomain routing. We will explain this important topic further. To understand this topic, uh, we would like to highlight one important aspect of the VPC. As you can see over here, your VPC1 has these digits 10.0.0.0 slash 16 and your subnets over here have the same kind of notation before the slash however they have 24 after the slash and if you notice the subnets are increasing with this value so this is 10.0.0.0 slash 24 this is 10.0.1.0.24 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 why is this notation being used and if you notice over here this virtual private cloud has a different notation whereas here it's starting with 172.16.0.0 slash 16 and this vpc3 vpc3 has got 172.31.0.0 slash 16 this is classless interdomain routing and we are creating blocks and we will explain this concept further in our next slide to understand more of how CIDR blocks or classless interdomain routing blocks work, we go back to some basic understanding of networking. If you remember, how do machines communicate over the internet? They require a IPv4 address to identify them from one place to another over the internet. Now, IPv4 address in decimal notation the way humans read it is, for example, 10.0.1.0. This decimal notation IPv4 address is read by a machine in binary format in a, as a combination of ones and zeros. So this address over here, which is 10.0.1.0 in binary format is represented as this. For IPv4 address, each octet over here is made up of 8 bits. Of either zeros or ones so each octet is a total of eight bits made up of either zeros or ones which is why it is also known as a binary octet your IPv4 address is made up of a total of 32 bits which are basically eight bits in each octet eight bits multiplied by four octets give you a total of 32 bits so as you can see over here the decimal value that can be in an octet could range from either 0 to 255 depending upon how the zeros and ones are put together your ipv4 address could have a decimal notation of either 0.0.0, .0 or all the way up to 255.255.255.255 .255 .255 .255. This is important to understand for us to understand how using this IPv4 addressing system and the CIDR block notation, we break up your VPC into subnets. Now in this example, we have an IPv4 address which is 10.0.0.0 with a backslash and a slash 24 suffix. What does this mean? It means that out of the entire 32 bits available in this IPv4 address, 
24 bits which are 8 plus 8 plus 8 these three octets or 24 bits are being used as a network identifier and only 32 minus 24 which is 8 bits is available for IPv4 hosts so a 10.0.0.0 slash 24 means that this subnet will have 32 minus 24 which is 2 to the power 8 256 hosts if you recall when we showed you the image of the VPC it showed that the VPC had a cider block of 10.0.0. slash 16 this means that out of the entire 32 bits 16 the first two are used as network identifiers and the remaining two bits sorry remaining two octets which are a total of 16 bits are available for the number of IPv4 hosts that we can have in our VPC so 2 to the power 16 means that our VPC can have up to 65,536 hosts so CIDR notation helps you to easily divide your VPC the maximum number of hosts into further smaller subnets and depending upon the notation it helps you figure out how many hosts you can have in each subnet now AWS rules of subnet masking are the allowed block size is either a slash 16 net mask which means 65,536 hosts or a slash 28 net mask which means a minimum the lowest number of hosts within a subnet could be 16 hosts now that you understand how many hosts that you can have in your VPC, the number of subnets that will be in your VPC is simply the total number of hosts, the total number of hosts in your VPC divided by the number of hosts you want to put per subnet. So if you want um, 256 hosts per subnet and your VPC has a total of 65,536 hosts, that means you will have a total of 8 subnets. Now let's understand how CIDR block works for IPv6 addresses. The difference between IPv4 and IPv6 is that IPv4 is going to be deprecated because of the limited number of IP addresses available on IPv4. And at some point in time, due to the larger number of uh, hosts available on IPv6 address system, there'll be more usage of IPv6. The difference between them in networking terminology is as follows as explained in our previous slide when we use a, a IPv4 address in binary format the decimal notation is over here and the binary format is shown over here it is made up of eight bits of zeros and ones and a total of four octets so IPv4 address is made up of a total of 32 bits or 32 zeros and ones however IPv6 address in human readable format is like this and it is in binary format made of not 8 but 16 bits of 8 octets each so this gives a significantly larger number of hosts that can be within your virtual private cloud the IPv6 address in human readable format is depicted like this and instead of using a dot it uses a semicolon to separate the octets AWS rules are very clear with IPv6. You can your AWS VPC size is fixed as slash 56. That means you can have up to 2 to the power 72 number of hosts, and your subnet have to be a slash 64, which means 128 minus 64, or up to 2 to the power 64 number of hosts. Now that we have better understanding of a virtual private cloud, a CIDR block, a IPv4 and IPv6 address, let us understand more about subnets. There are three types of subnets in AWS. The public subnet is simply your a subnet made up of IPv4 or IPv6 traffic that is routed to an internet gateway or an egress only internet gateway and can reach the public internet. A private subnet is simply uh, a subnet which contains either IPv4 or IPv6 traffic that is not routed to an internet gateway or egress only internet gateway and thus cannot reach the public internet. 
VPN only subnet is simply a subnet that doesn't have route to the internet gateway, but it has its traffic routed to a v virtual private gateway or a site to site VPN connection. Currently, AWS does not support IPv6 traffic over a site to site VPN connection. This point is important and it could be a potential exam question. Your subnet configuration could be either IPv4, IPv6 only, or dual stack. As shown in the previous slides, the subnet sizing for IPv4, the allowed block size is between a slash 16 net mask, which contains 65,536 hosts or IP addresses, or a slash 28 net mask, which gives the most lowest amount of 16 IP addresses or 16 hosts. It is recommended that your CIDR block contain private IPv4 address ranges, either uh, starting from 10 dot o dot o dot o to this one or with 172 or with 192 as shown over here your vpc and your subnet sizing for ipv6 when you create a new vpc the ipv6 cider block is a fixed prefix length of slash 56 as we shown in the previous illustration and a subnet has a fixed prefix length of 64 so a ipv6 virtual profile virtual private cloud will have fixed prefix length of slash 56 and the subnets within it will have a cider block of slash 64. Every subnet that you create is automatically associated with the default main route table for the VPC. However, you can create custom route, ta custom route tables for a subnet. With respect to subnet security, every subnet that you create is automatically associated with the VPC's default network access control list also known as NACLs. EC2 instances created programmatically are automatically assigned to the default security group for the VPC. Security group is an additional firewall which is specific to the EC2 instance, whereas the network access control list is a firewall for your subnets. We will cover these topics in further videos. To end this video, we go over how does the knowledge of virtual private cloud help you achieve the exam domain knowledge requirements. As per the exam guide, Domain 1 Design Resilient Architectures, you should know how to design highly available and or fault tolerant architectures. Now your VPC is automatically highly available because it comes with availability zones which could be either 2 or 3 depending upon the minimum number of availability zones in that AWS region. So your VPC is always highly available and to recall a highly available architecture has a possibility of service interruption or disruption and it is rectified by either by minimizing the downtime in restoring interrupted services. If you wish to achieve a fault tolerant architecture and the definition of fault tolerant is a fault tolerant environment has no service interruption or disruption but it comes at a significantly higher cost by replicating redundant resources. To achieve fault tolerance you can either replicate your AWS resources in another VPC either in the same AWS region or replicate your AWS resources in another VPC in another AWS region. The reason why fault tolerance is considered higher cost is because you need to replicate your AWS resources which could be redundant and not used except in the case of a service interruption or service disruption. That is why fault tolerance is always a high expensive option to use but it depends upon use case if you can survive with a highly available architecture or you require a fault tolerant architecture this brings us to our, the end of this particular video we will continue on our explanation of virtual private cloud and in our next video we will go over route tables I hope this video was useful and if you found this content useful please hit the like button and subscribe and keep watching our videos. Thank you.